one-child policy and its impact on, on the status of women in China quite negatively and has focused uh, predominantly on female infanticide and the um, and this, uh, son preference. But actually what uh, the research that I did what found was that um, beca because of a lack of sons within the family, because if you ha can only have one child and that child is a daughter, that daughter is increasingly taking on the roles that the son previously would, such as taking responsibility for parents in their old age. And because of this, parents are choosing to invest more in their daughters than ever before. And this is leading to more female graduates than China has ever had, um, and, and women making more demands in the workplace and in, in the family home. Also, because families have fewer children generally, more resources are available to, to those children that they have. Um, and so there is an increase in university, the, the ability to fund university education, even in the rural areas. So um, I was living in Shanxi province, um, uh, in the east of Shanxi province, which is obviously quite far north. Um, Shanxi province is one of the poorest in China. It has a GDP well below average, and even below Tibet, which is quite extraordinary. Um, a large coal, coal, coal mine industry which has led to large inequalities um, in wealth. So the, the political system is largely dominated by, by coal mine owners who are uh, extraordinarily wealthy and many of the people that I was working with would, would have worked in the coal mines. Um, the, the county that I was living in, the, the, kind of the village area, um, had uh, in total 2, uh, 240,000 people which is tiny by Chinese standards. Um, it was a three-hour bus to near a city, uh, uh, mainly corn agriculture, and it had a special communist history, which meant it was very, um, kind of very pro the Communist Party, which is actually quite unusual at the moment in China. So just a few, a kind of brief introduction, the, the village. Um, again, it's still a very rural area, um, farmers coming in daily into the market to sell their vegetables, um, quite little and extensive. Um, still very rural forms of transportation, things like that. This was, I was living with a family, um, this was their courtyard, this was their home. Um, the street outside where they were living, neighbours, things like this. And this was the, 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 the couple that I was living with. He was a, he's a retired politics teacher and she used to run a, a barber shop. So, but what I'm mainly going to talk about is the one child policy. This is, um, I'm sure you all know the one-child policy um, means that about, around 40% of the families in China can only have one child. Um, in the rural areas, it's different. You're allowed two children. Um, if the first, if your first child is a girl, you can have a boy. Um, so there's there's kind of a gender inequality in the system. This was a poster that was uh, that was displayed in the center of the village, and it, it's uh, basically all the very intricate laws of, of the one-child policy. So it's, it's something that's really quite in people's faces, um, but which people are quite quite unhappy about, but they, they understand, um, they kind of understand why it's there. Um, and this, this was a friend that I was staying with. So basically, the one-child policy was, as I kind of uh, mentioned just now, it was introduced in 1978. So this, we are now in the second generation of people who are single children. And that is having a very strange, demographic kind of impact, which means that 
children are now responsible, single children are now responsible for looking after uh, two sets of grandparents and their parents. And so there's a great pressure on, <coughs> on kind of the young people today to be able to earn enough to support their elderly relatives. Uh, if you, you double that, of course, if you marry and, for example, if your wife is having a child. So there is immense pressure on the younger population. Um, and as I said before, it's been criticised for its effect on the female population previously. Though actually, I, I would argue in the long term, it's having quite positive effects. So the question that, that my research was really aiming to answer was that considering many families now only have daughters, how have the traditional gender roles been altered? And I decided to focus mainly on education for a number of reasons. This was a, uh, this was a school that I was teaching in during that month. It was a middle school. Um, education in China has long been regarded as, as something that people of high status have access to. But um, at the moment in China, everyone up until the age of 14 is eligible for free education, which, which is quite <coughs> extraordinary in a country of that size. Um, education is expensive after the age of 14, and to, to go to university requires a massive investment of parents, of, of financial resources by parents, often requiring them to, to borrow uh, quite extensively from neighbours and family and also from, from banks. So to send a child to education is a massive, to, to university is a massive statement about what you think about their future and, and, how, and how much they're going to return to you. I would argue that in China at the moment it is purely a financial investment. You expect your children to be able to support you because of the, the resources that you have put in. And as I said previously, that's, that leads to a lot of pressure on children and to a lot of, um, even many kind of instances in China recently of, of young people, even children as young as seven and eight, uh, committing suicide or attempting suicide because of the pressure that's put on them. Um, so it's quite, it's kind of quite extraordinary. But, Parents are very pro the education of daughters, which is quite new in China. Um, previously, the uh, resources would have been put on the son's education because he would have had primary responsibility to look after parents when, when they got old. Ch uh, daughters would marry out. And it was said that to educate a daughter was a waste of an education because she would, she would marry into another family. Um, but increasingly, this, this is changing, and, um, and parents have seen the value of educating, educating their daughters also. So this, for example, was a class that I was teaching. I was teaching two classes a day and giving one lecture a day. Um, yeah, as I said, strong Confucian respect for education, but very, a very top-down education, and a very, very strong association between educational achievement and social status. And I guess in this regard, I would kind of disagree with the film that we've just watched. Um, yes, education doesn't lead to a job, but no education <coughs> leads to no job. You know, if you don't have an education, there, there's very little for you left. You're, you're stuck in the village, and your marriage prospects are also very low. Um, so, if you if you want to rise in China, you must. <coughs> um, entrance into university is exceptionally competitive. It, to, for the top universities, there would be one place for every thousand applicants. Um, and it's interesting, actually. This is kind of a side issue, but when when asked why university is so competitive, my Chinese students would always say there are too many people in China. The reason university is competitive is there's too many people. Not that there's too few universities, but that there's too many people. And it was a continual reinforcement of this discourse on population and a, a legitimization of the one child policy. Um, this is the first generation pretty much to attend university. The students that I were working with were incredible. Their, their great grandparents were farmers, their grandparents were farmers, their parents were farmers, and they were very realistically aiming to be doctors, lawyers, brain surgeons. Do you know, this was very much within their kind of sphere of potential. And, and that has led to great um, generational <coughs> gaps, but, but I think, you know, essentially it's very positive. The school day lasts from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. The, they have one weekend off a month. So, quite relaxed. Previously, education wasn't linked to social status at all. This is a... This is a photograph of a friend, actually, uh, from 1984. The, they said that middle school was very relaxed, very chilled. You finished when you were about 14, 15. And then the Communist uh, Party would, would give you a job uh, instantly after graduating. There was no applications. You were just um, you were placed in a job. So for example, at the age of 15, he was given a job in a bank, which he still holds. 
Whereas these are my students leaving school at 10 p.m. to go do their homework for another two hours to then get up for six to be in school for seven. So it's quite, it, there's, a, there's a big difference. But they're very keen and they see this as being a massive potential and a massive opportunity. Um, and I think, especially for the women, especially for the girls, they feel like a lot of responsibility, an increased responsibility because of, because of their kind of new gender roles, I guess. Yeah, she could all go out that door. Yeah. Reintroduce me. Okay, if you want. I think I'm fine. Shall I come a bit closer? Will people be able to hear you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just. It's already a bit weird. Um, okay, so basically, yeah, to, to I'm more than halfway through, but basically what I was saying before was that the there's a lot of pressure on students just because of the um, competition for university and the, the way in which university is so close to I'm going to read you out some quotes, um, <laughs> unfortunately, but whatever. And the, so basically, I think that a large, uh, a large reason why, the, why students put so much pressure on themselves and why there is so much pressure from teachers and, and from parents is because the, the, their ability to, socially, to, to kind of rise socially is very linked to their, their, uh, their ability to look after their parents in old age. In China at the moment, there, there is very little kind of social support and no pension systems, especially if you're working in the mines or if you're a farmer or something like this. So your, your uh, future security as an elderly person is very linked up to how well you can educate your child. So for example, I think a, a quotation that's really telling that came from an interview with one of the teachers I did, one of these English teachers said, if the students are not studying hard, I often tell them, look at your parents. They have a poor life, their clothes are old, they do not eat meat often. They save all this money in order to pay for your education. So a massive kind of moral pressure on the students um, and, and especially as an only child, your, your, your parents' well-being is entirely wrapped up in your own success. Similarly, um, a female student told me that the teachers give us a lot of work because they want us to do well in the exams and have a good life. If we get a good education, then we can get a good job and earn money to support our parents. Our parents had little education, their lives are very hard. And this is from a daughter of a, of a, a labourer who worked from 7 in the morning until 11 at night. And, and was paid very little and so they they um, I think it was really interesting that people as young as 15 and 16 had such a vision for their lives as being wrapped up in their parents lives and also the reinforcement of education as a means to social mobility what she was saying was that my parents didn't have education look what happened to them I'm not going to be like that you know um, and so again like what I was saying before is if your only child is a daughter then what choice do you have but to educate her both educate her so that she can herself earn money and educate her so that she, she ranks higher in the marriage market and can marry someone with an education who can then support you. Um, but I think it's really interesting that the, the, the fact that women are, so, are becoming so educated is leading to a really weird imbalance between men and women in China to a point where women don't want to marry Chinese men anymore because, because it's, a very patri it's still quite a patriarchal society. And uh, I've even heard examples of, of um, kind of brides to be writing contracts with their husbands so that they will promise to do some of the housework once they're married, <laughs> you know. Um, and, and again, like demanding massive bride wealth, maybe an apartment and a car before they'll marry them, which again puts pressure on the men to succeed well in, in their careers in order that they can marry a woman of the, of the same educational status. So it's kind of, it's, a, it's again an increased impetus on the parents to educate their daughters. Um, however, I wouldn't say that this is um, annulling the male bias. I, I, uh, I collected data from 718 families looking at the, um, the family structure of how many girls and boys they had. And uh, 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 even in the city, uh, a family that has a girl first is twice as likely to have a second child than if they have a boy first. So even though that, that would mean paying a massive fine, a fine that is, that's a very, very large percentage of, of, a, of an average wage. 
So there's still, even outside of female infanticide, there's still a strong male preference, uh, whereby they'll, they'll continue to have children until they have a boy. And one example in my data, which is a real anomaly actually, was uh, they, they had four girls and then their fifth child was a boy. And this was quite common, um, kind, of with, kind of within, not to that extent, but quite common within the data. Um, so I, I think also an interesting point to consider is the, the what's happening with the economy in China, which is which is quite extraordinary. In the big cities, the, the prices of apartments have um, have increased by 400% in the past four years. So there's a massive economic boom. Things are becoming a lot more expensive. Meat and commodities are becoming a lot more expensive. The the maternity leave is only three is only three months, and so you cannot you cannot have a family with only one person working. The wife, for the first time in Chinese history, also has to work in order to support the family. And so again, the, the, it is desirable to marry someone who, who will earn a high, high salary. And again, this is kind of impetus, impetus on the women to, um, to, to be educated. Um, okay, so I had some photos I was going to show you, which I can't. Um, um, yeah, so for example, um, it's, it's becoming a source of pride for women to be able to support their to be able to support their families. Um, one of the teachers that I was working with was very proud to tell me that although she had three brothers, she was the one that was supporting her her parents because she had been the one that succeeded most in education and was able to to get a job as a teacher. Whereas her her brothers had gotten jobs as kind of laborers and kind of quite common people, as she would say. Um, and I think I think this. This ability of women to support their families is, is really changing not only the impetus for girls to be educated, but the, the cultural valuation of women. So for example, one of my students said, in China, many people think that boys are better than girls. My parents used to think that, but then I was born and they love me very much. They think that I am lively and clever and can support them when they are old. It is a lot of pressure on me. And so the by the, through the opportunity to be educated, women are, are proving to to the, to the older generation that they, they're capable of this and that they can also do something to the family. But had she had a brother, those educational resources would have gone to her brother, and and that potential would have never been able to, to kind of be manifested. Um, and so, just to kind of to to, uh, to finish, I, I'd like to finish with a quotation from uh, an English.